Hi, I'm Ingrid Ladal. As we've seen, COVID-19 has drastically changed the way healthcare providers and educators plan and deliver training and education. We've learned that in order to get healthcare workers up to speed quickly, safely and effectively, remote learning is an extremely valuable methodology. You will hear shortly from our global expert panel on how remote simulation is helping learners build confidence and competence. With this new emerging educational methodology, many nursing programs turn to the inaxial standards of best practice as a source of support, but many still have questions on how to really implement them, and we would love to help. Whether you need assistance in implementing remote simulations or need basic simulator or software training, our global team has the experience to help lead you forwards to what may become the new normal in simulation training. Before I end, I just want to express our sincere gratitude towards healthcare providers and educators like you using simulation training to help prepare the world for crises like COVID-19 and beyond. We have set the goal to help save 1 million more lives every year by 2030. We know we cannot do it alone, but we can do it together with people like yourself. We hope you enjoy the webinar. My name is Graham Folds and I'm the Regional Director for Laidel across the Asia Pacific region. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome a number of attendees from all over the Asia Pacific region, from Canada, from the US and from Latin America. I'd also like to welcome four international thought leaders who will be presenting on the first four and actual standards of best practice, as well as to say a big thank you to our team in Canada who will be demonstrating a virtual simulation, including a pre-brief and a debrief. The objectives for today are threefold. To discuss the relevance of the actual standards of best practice in a COVID era, to demonstrate virtual delivery of a simulation experience, and to discuss the challenges of meeting the actual standards of best practice in a virtual environment. The format for today is threefold. Firstly, we have each of our four international key thought leaders presenting on one of the first four and actual standards of best practice. Then we have a virtual simulation where a team in Canada will be demonstrating a pre-brief, an actual virtual simulation, and then a debrief of that simulation with a nursing student. And then finally, we have a four international key thought leaders will be reflecting on their individual and actual standard of best practice in the context of the virtual simulation we've just demonstrated. And after this, we will have plenty of time for Q&A. So once again, I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. I hope you find it educationally rewarding and there are some key takeout messages. Thanks everybody, enjoy. How do the Anaxal standards guide simulation when using remote learning principles? Yeah, thanks, James, and, th and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about the Anaxal standards and particularly the Anaxal standard of design. So the, the standard for simulation design is probably, from my perspective, one of the most exciting, but also one of the most important standards because it really does make that connection between simulation as an educational experience or an educational opportunity uh, rather than just uh, you know something that that's a, a pure game or entertainment or something like that so when the uh, anaxal standards were first envisaged it took or developed it took a couple of years for the simulation design standard to to show up and the standards as they are at the moment uh, have been last published in 2016 and so uh, whilst they're currently under review the uh, standard for simulation design does actually actually stand up pretty well uh, in terms of designing simulations for a for distance learning or for a different medium to what we're not really used to uh, mm. and I guess the uh, the standard for design or well, the design standard does actually provide a fantastic starting point for people who might be concerned of where to start or how to translate their simulations that have been traditionally face-to-face -face into a more uh, online or remote uh, format. 
So I think the standard and this, the standards generally, but this standard in particular has significant relevance for designing and running simulations uh, via distance learning or remote learning. I would like to talk about how our College of Nursing used the Nexus standard when using remote learning in COVID-19 outbreak situation here. Our university allowed less than 20% of students to take face-to-face -face classes. So our College of Nursing provided clinical lab and simulation courses as a hybrid simulation education or a hybrid education. The Inoxil standard guided us when we designed and conducted classes for hybrid simulation education or hybrid education. For example, considering the level of four-year nursing student who completed all the theory courses in the women's nursing course as a hybrid simulation education, we developed and conducted the postpartum hemorrhage nursing module using map-based simulation VSIM and simulator SIMOM. Also in mental health nursing course, as a hybrid education, we developed and conducted a post-traumatic stress disorder nursing module using the tele-education and standardized patient. So the Anaxo standards were created to essentially include a wide variety of types of simulation. So whether that be mannequin-based simulation, simulation with simulated or standardized patients, um, but also to an extent to, with, uh, to include virtual or remote uh, simulations or remote learning. So the thing that you also have to remember is that the standards of best practice, they are evidence informed and they are based on the best available evidence of that time. So the current standards were published in 2016, they are currently being revised, but that means that even in 2016, if you think about it, we weren't necessarily doing a whole lot of virtual or remote learning and simulation. So if you're looking for a recipe, um, it's there, but it might not necessarily apply to virtual simulation. You kind of have to think it through a little bit more. There is a ton of evidence that are in the standards, so definitely have a look at that. But what that means is that you have to keep in mind that, like I said, that they, are, they were created a few years ago. The literature is where it was at that time. So you really need to go back to the foundational elements of the simulation. Really look at, the, at each one of those criteria, and especially with um, things like facilitation, because what you have to do is you have to have a look at what exactly are they asking me to do and how can I apply it to this, this kind of an environment? Because really going back to basics, including your objectives, including the facilitation, including the debriefing, those are all going to be part of a virtual simulation as well. But you just really need to know how you can apply those standards and kind of massage the standards a little bit more when you're looking at the virtual or remote simulation experience. Well, the wonderful thing about the standards is that they apply to simulation regardless of the modality. So they're really based in the best evidence around the pedagogy and not necessarily the particular mode or the particular application of simulation. So everything that applies to mannequin simulation also applies when we're using screen-based virtual simulation or when we're using standardized patient simulation, or when we're using AR or VR. So luckily, one set of standards applies to all. If we think about the, uh, specifically about the criterion of the facilitation standard of best practice, how can we practically apply those criterion to remote learning? Can, can you provide us with an example or two? Yeah, sure. So in all standards, uh, but more particularly with the standard of facilitation, um, they do provide you with specific criterion that you need to include in order to meet the standard. But then they also highlight what can happen if you don't meet the standard, just sort of what the consequences are. So for example, with facilitation, the overall consequence of not meeting the standard is that you can have a reduction in engagement within the simulation, which none of us want, um, but also a decrease in the opportunity opportunities for the participants to be successful and meet the expectations of the simulation, which we also don't want. Right. So 
the criterion, they really give you a bit of a framework to start to, uh, to use when you're looking at your simulation. So with facilitation, the criteria that they include is that it has to be, you have to have an approach that's appropriate to the level of the learner. So generally this means how much involvement you have with them during the simulation, how much preparatory materials you need to provide them, how many prompts and cues you need to provide them. So really depending on the level of your student and how much experience they have in this kind of environment, make sure that you provide that for them. Um, you also need to include a pre-brief or preparatory materials because this really does lay out your expectations of the simulation. It kind of like sets the mood of the simulation. So you need to make sure that you do that as well. And again, that will be dependent on the level of your learner. You also need to, like I said before, consider what kind of prompts and cues you might want to include. And in the standard, they talk about uh, prompt, uh, sorry, realism cues and um, conceptual cues that you might want to include. So I would encourage people to go and look at the differences between that because you really need to pay attention to those as well and how you might include these in your simulation. You also do need to support the learner through this experience, which might look a little bit different in the virtual environment, just because we're not there in person. Uh, so definitely consider what kind of support they need, whether it's technical support, whether it's just an explanation of what they should be doing. So make sure you include that in there as well. So like I said, in remote learning, things will look similar, but a little bit different um, in that you really need to make sure that you attend to all of those. Uh, because what you have to make sure that you do is that's like, again, like I said before, that sort of sets your foundation. So we try to do these in more like a virtual orientation. Um, so we asked for some examples. So we do that as a virtual orientation um, for the students so that way it's something they can kind of go back to if they need additional instructions or whatever, um, then they can go back and rewatch these things. Um, they also, we also provide quite a few additional um, videos for both the facilitators and the students. Um, what to expect in this kind of a virtual environment. So it's really about setting that foundation because I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of laying that foundation for simulation because this ultimately affects the way that the simulation unfolds, which can also affect the debriefing. So I know it's not necessarily the in simulation part that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. but if you don't have a good foundation on that simulation, the rest of it, can, it's that, what's that expression, you know, a house of cards can easily, easily fall down. In terms of how to practically apply the criterion of outcomes and objectives to remote learning, we need to think about how much you are able to assess or evaluate the level of learning outcomes in the given remote learning situation. Considering the limitation of remote learning, we can use blended text to me hierarchy classification of learning domains to level objectives from simple to complex and also cognitive and affective and psychomotor domain of learning as well. Also, we need to consider expected outcomes, which needs to be driven by the objectives and concept within nursing program curriculum. As I said previously, when you are doing simulation courses for both year nursing students who are about to graduate, we've implemented a hybrid simulation education to assess and evaluate how much their practical performance were achieved directly in terms of outcomes and objectives of the course. Yeah, sure. The the how we could apply it. So if we're let let's say we're retrofitting a, a simulation and we have uh, a simulation that we're running that is face to face that we would consider running remotely, then pull out the standard for simulation design and use it as a as a I guess a tool to consider the ways in which the simulation that you currently have designed might translate to something remote. Uh, how what adjustments might need to be made. Uh, and whether it actually is viable or not. So the first question, I guess, that's, that's asked or is asked of us when we're looking at the Anaxal Standard for Simulation Design is that we're looking at uh, really understanding what the need is or what the purpose is that this simulation needs to address. So, uh, you know, usually, uh, according to the standards, we should be understanding what the problem is that we're trying to address or what the need is that we would use the, uh, that we would therefore design a simulation. So what is it that we want to achieve? What is it that we want to do? And uh, 
by looking at, I guess, the simulation uh, that you have already designed and thinking about, well, what are the, uh, what, is, what is it that you want to achieve and is this still going to be relevant for uh, a remote learning situation is the first hurdle that you need to get over. The second one then is looking at the learning outcomes and objectives. So uh, you either construct them from scratch or if you have a pre-existing simulation, then what are the objectives of the simulation board? of the simulation program, but also what are the learning outcomes that are set for this particular simulation scenario, uh, and are they achievable uh, in a, a distance learning context? And this is the point that um, there's two parts, isn't there? One of it is the, the, the practicality, the scenario, can it be replicated uh, via remote? The other part is can you meet the achievement of the learning outcomes? So. Can you demonstrate the situation, represent the situation? The other one is, can the students actually attain what you want them to attain? The, the really nice part about the standards, though, one of the, the key things I love about this uh, standard in particular is that it does uh, really focus on simulation as a learning experience rather than a particular mode of simulation. And so whilst we might have developed a simulation scenario based on mannequins or simulated or standardised patients uh, or indeed games uh, or different technology platforms, uh, might even be a written case study, uh, the standard asks us to look at the quality of the simulation and the design structure of a simulation regardless of what the delivery mode is or what the mode of simulation is. And I think that's where ultimately the value of this standard comes is because it really is not think, making us think about delivering simulation in a particular way, but of delivering quality simulation or designing quality simulation. So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, leave it there. Uh, but one, I guess one more point though, before I do is would be in the consideration of running the simulation scenario that might already be designed, is to think about the levels of fidelity or indeed the types of uh, different fidelity or authenticity that you might have uh, in the simulation that is otherwise, that is normally face to face or in whatever mode it's normally delivered. And what are those levels of fidelity, uh, realism, authenticity that can be replicated when delivering a simulation uh, or designing a simulation for remote. So sorry, I keep flipping between delivering and designing because I guess in my mind, I'm, I'm always thinking uh, those two things in tandem. One of them is the design component, but then what's the application of that or what's the operationalization of it? Uh, because again, if it, there might be some um, you can't look at any of those parts in isolation. There might be some trade-offs that you can make in terms of the simulation design or the simulation fidelity. But if you can't replicate some of the critical points of the simulation so that students can achieve the learning outcome set, then we're going to have to change something. We're going to have to either change the learning outcome or outcomes, or we're going to have to change uh, the scenario itself. Uh, something may need to give. So overall, the standard has incredible uh, applicability for remote learning. Sure. So all five of the criterion in the um, debriefing standard apply to uh, simulation, regardless, again, of the modality. So criterion one is that the debriefer is... Uh, facil or the debriefing is facilitated by a person who is competent in the debriefing process. So again, when we are doing virtual screen-based simulation, we want to make sure that our debriefers have training and practice and that they are competent and um, able to facilitate a good, robust, engaging conversation. Um, and we also want to make sure that we're using a debriefing method that is both theoretically derived and evidence-based. So we want to make sure that we have the elements of theory in that debriefing so that we have a good learning experience and get those learning outcomes that we're looking for. We want to make sure that debriefing uh, supports confidentiality and trust. So with screen-based virtual simulation, we still set the safe container, just like we do in all the other kinds of simulation we do. We start by establishing an environment of trust and an environment where we can have a robust, confidential conversation where um, everyone who's participating can share truly what they experienced without judgment or concern that um, that, that by revealing the thinking behind the action, somehow there's going to be retribution. So again, we support this 
the briefing is supported by this um, uh, safe container. Excellent. Criteria. Oh, I'm sorry. Go. Please no, continue. No, I was going to say, and, yep. and, and debriefing is, is really where uh, many argue that's where the learning occurs, right? It, it does. It does. And so in order for that to happen, criterion three is that debriefing has to be facilitated by a person who has uh, devoted enough time to effectively debrief. So there's kind of a couple things in there. You need to make sure that you have allowed sufficient time for debriefing. And many times debriefing is significantly longer than the actual simulation scenario itself so that you can dig deep into, again, the thinking and the actions and get um, a good understanding about what the participants were processing as they were caring for the simulated patient. Um, and then you also need to make sure that your debriefing is congruent with the simulation objectives and outcomes. Now, people get confused about that one all the time because it doesn't mean that you just debrief to what you wanted to happen. You actually have to debrief to what actually happened. So the objective might be that the, um, that the participant does one thing, but they never, if they never get there, you have to also focus on what happened that they didn't get there. You can't just devote, uh, devote your time to debriefing on what was intended to occur. So we, we keep the objectives forefront, but we also make sure that every debriefing is individualized to the experience that this particular group of learners actually had. Wow, thank you. Um, that's a great tee up to the scenario that we're about to watch. Uh, we'll see that in just a few moments. And then after that scenario, we'll come back and we'll uh, hear a few more comments from you, doctor. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Thanks, Alicia and Alyssa, for joining us for today's telesimulation as part of our MedSurge simulation course. You can see on your screen, we've also got Bruce joining us today. He's playing the role of your patient, Kenneth Bronson, today. Last week, we spent a bit of time getting comfortable in this online environment, but we didn't actually run a simulation, which we'll do today. And I wanted just to go back and remind you of some of the key points of how we can best interact in this virtual environment. Since we're in a small group, I think we can all keep our microphones unmuted. That way it'll be easier to have conversations, unless you've got some background noise going on at home, then you can turn that off. For the purpose of the simulation, your video camera will indicate if you're in the room or not. So when we're ready to get started, I'll turn my camera off, as well as anyone else who is outside the room. And then as cameras pop back on, you'll know that those people are in that patient environment. If I turn my camera on during the simulation, it will probably be to clarify some piece of information or make an adjustment, just like I might pop back into our physical simulation lab on campus. What will be really useful is if you can verbalize as many of your thoughts as possible. This really helps your instructors give you better feedback, give you credit for the critical thinking that's going on in your head, which sometimes isn't as easy to see in the virtual environment. So if you can speak anything that comes to mind out loud, that will be really helpful. After the simulation session virtually, we'll take a few minutes and then we'll regroup and do a debriefing just as we would in our physical lab. Do you have any questions for me before we get started? No. At this point, Alyssa, I'll ask you to turn your camera off to indicate that you're out of the room. And Alicia, you'll be our first student nurse responding to this patient. And we'll have a brief look at what we know about Kenneth Bronson. Kenneth Bronson is a 27-year-old male that was just admitted to the medical ward from the emergency department. He presented to the emergency department with a cough, chest pain, and fever two hours ago. 
A chest x-ray revealed left lower lobe pneumonia. An IV of normal saline has been started at 75 milliliters per hour. He is receiving oxygen at two liters per minute by nasal cannula. His saturation on room air was 90% and that has increased to 93% with the supplemental oxygen. He had a temperature of 39.2 degrees Celsius or 102.5 Fahrenheit and was given one gram of paracetamol in the emergency department. Pharmacy has just delivered the ceftriaxone IV, which is due to be given. It's 11 o'clock, you're in the medical board. In terms of Mr. Bronson's past medical history, he's generally healthy. He was seen by a general practitioner six months ago with strep throat, and he received penicillin and had an allergic reaction, which he described as a generalized itching. He smokes two packs a day of cigarettes and has been doing so for the last 10 years. In his recent medical history, he's had general fatigue, fever, and a productive cough for about a week. He started to have chest tightness and difficulty breathing, which brought him to the emergency department. And he's now on the medical ward where you're with him. Okay. Good morning, Kenneth. My name is Alicia. I'm going to be the registered nurse here with you today. How are you doing? Hi, Alicia. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Okay. I'm just going to grab a set of vital signs on you at this time. Uh, at this time, I would also like to do a focused respiratory assessment and auscultate your lungs. Okay. Okay, so I did hear some crackles in his lungs and decreased lung sounds in the lower uh, left lobe. Your oxygen saturation looks good. I'm gonna check that your IV site is okay. You're currently running normal saline at 75 cc's an hour okay. as per the doctor's orders. Um, so Kenneth, I'm going to leave you here with your call bell now and I'm going to go check what Dr. Yon has ordered for you. And if you need anything in the meantime, you give me a call. Okay. So I can see here the orders. So the doctor's ordered oxygen to keep sats greater than 92%, normal saline, 75 mils an hour, vital signs Q4, and he's ordered ceftriaxone one gram every 12 hours, and Tylenol is just given in emerge. Okay. So at this time, I would go and do a further patient assessment on his recent penicillin reaction. Uh, so Kenneth, um, I saw in your report that you were recently prescribed an antibiotic called penicillin by your general uh, practitioner or your family doctor. Um, and it said that you had a reaction. So I was just wondering if you could give me some more information on that reaction and what that was like for you. Mm, I, that was so, that was about six months ago. Okay. Um, and, and I took it and Alicia, I felt kind of just itchy all over. Um, okay. Mm. Did you have any shortness of breath? Were there any hives in and around your mouth? Did your tongue swell? Any symptoms like that? No, I don't remember anything like that. I would have remembered that. Okay. And did, were you able to finish the dose of the antibiotic or was it stopped early? No, I think you're supposed to finish it, aren't you? Okay. Yes. I just wanted to check and right. see. Um, what the doctor did for you in that situation. So the doctors ordered this antibiotic called ceftriaxone, and this antibiotic, if you've had a reaction to penicillin before, can increase your chance of reacting to this new antibiotic ceftriaxone. Okay. So I'm gonna go verify with the doctor um, that this he'd like to proceed with this order, and then um, if we're good to go, I'll be back in with your antibiotic in a few moments, okay? Okay. Okay. Emerge. Oh, hi, Dr. Yan. It's Alicia calling from Med6. I just want to um, recheck an order with you regarding Kenneth Bronson, the new admit with pneumonia. Right. Um, you had ordered him to start ceftriaxone, one gram IV piggyback Q12. Um, he recently had a reaction to penicillin with his family physician. He had itchiness all over, um, no respiratory symptoms. Am I okay to proceed? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks for calling. Good. Um, yeah, he, we, I saw that in his history. 
he, uh, he only had the symptoms once, the first time he took it. Uh, he didn't report it to anyone, and he just he finished the whole course and didn't have any other incidents. So that's why I thought we'd be okay with the cephalus form. Um, so yeah, so let's go ahead. Thanks for checking, and um, let, let me know if you need anything else. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Dr. Young. Okay, so now that I've received the okay um, from the physician and I've clarified the order, um, at this time I would bring in the ceftriaxone and um, start running it via IV piggyback for my patient. Um, and I would educate him that this is an antibiotic that the doctor has ordered. Uh, so Kenneth, I'm just gonna be starting this IV antibiotic for you. It's called ceftriaxone. Um, it's just gonna run here. It'll run for um, about 30 minutes. We'll run it over. And if you have any symptoms, shortness of breath, difficulty with breathing, if you notice any rashes or irritation on your skin, general itchiness, anything like that, you're gonna let me know, okay? I'll let you know. Okay. Mm. Alicia? Yeah? I'm starting to feel scratchiness in my throat a little bit. Okay. So at this time, I would stop the antibiotic infusion. So Kenneth, are you having difficulty with breathing? Okay. I can see that he has labored breathing. And at this time, I'm going to call for help from one of my fellow nurses. Hi, Alicia. What's going on? Hi, Alyssa. This is the new admit Kenneth Bronson. Um, he seems to be having a reaction to the ceftriaxone antibiotic that I just started. Um, I'm going to go contact the doctor. At this time, could you get a set of vitals for me and yes. stay with the patient? Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Emerge, Dr. Young. Hi, Dr. Young. It's Alicia calling back from Med6 regarding Kenneth Bronson. Right. I just started his IV piggyback ceftriaxone dose, and he's experiencing um, worsening shortness of breath and some uh, throat itchiness. Oh, boy. I think, I think your instincts were right when you just called me, weren't they? Um, okay, so have you shut the infusion off? The infusion's been stopped. Okay, excellent. So um, let's uh, assume we're having an anaphylactic reaction here, Alicia. I'm going to send these orders through to your screen, but why don't we give him... Um, Sounds great. Thanks, Dr. Young. Okay, so now that I've received my orders on here, um, I can see that I need to get the patient on a cardiac uh, monitor. So at this time, I'm gonna ask Alyssa to put the patient on a cardiac monitor and get an ECG going for me. Um, and I can see the new med orders that have come through and I know that the epinephrine is our priority drug at this time. So I'm going to administer that I am. Perfect. So let's put him on the cardiac monitor and cycle the BP. Also, Mr. Bronson, let's, I'll, I'll help you sit up a little bit just to get you more comfortable here. Are we still feeling as bad as before? Okay. So Nurse Alicia is working on something for you right now. And um, the cardiac monitor is set up for you, Alicia. Thank you. Alicia, I see you're just about to use your skills trainer. Could you please adjust the camera a little bit so we can see better? Yeah, for sure. And then you can continue the simulation. Thank you, that's perfect. Okay, so I'm going to clean my injection site because I know that epinephrine is given via IM injections. I'm going to pull back the skin. <laughs> Kenneth, you're going to feel a little poke here, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I've given the IM epinephrine. 
Um, at this time, Alyssa, if you could grab the gravel and give it IV push 50 milligrams and let me know when you've got that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to reassess our patient. So I'd like to get a full set of vital signs and I'd also like to auscultate his lungs. Okay, so I've done the push. Okay, Kenneth, how are you feeling? Better now. What was that that you gave me? Okay, so I just gave you an injection. We call it epinephrine. If you've ever heard of an EpiPen, it's the same drug. Um, we just don't have that form in our hospital. Um, you, I, the physician and I believe that you had an anaphylactic reaction to the antibiotic that we gave you. Thanks so much, everyone. Let's take a five-minute break. If you need to rearrange your desk, grab a, a cup of tea, grab a comfy chair, and we'll come back and do a virtual debriefing. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming back, everyone. I hope you had a little bit of a break, had a chance to sit back from the scenario. What we'll do now, we'll go into a debriefing. Uh, this could take two or three times as long as the actual scenario, so we're in no rush here. I want this to be a space where we can really give each other honest and constructive feedback. Uh, and our main goal here is to not to evaluate or any, anything in this scenario. This is really to learn from the situation and bring that forward into our clinical practice. So I'll start off with Alicia as our primary nurse responding to the scenario. How did the overall situation with the patient make you feel? Um, overall, it made me realize how quickly a reaction could happen in the real clinical setting. It's not something I've ever experienced in clinical and it's not something that I would feel overly comfortable experiencing in a real clinical situation. So I could see how um, quickly you could feel anxious in that situation and how quickly um, things changed. What is it about that speed that makes us feel anxious? Um, I think it's about the fact that you have someone's like well-being. They're looking at you, you know, needing things and you're the person that can get it for them. You're the only person. Can you tell us, remind us what you observed and what led you down your diagnosis of an anaphylactic reaction? Um, well, it was really just the sudden onset. I had only just started the antibiotic and kind of it was already in the back of my mind that he had had a previous reaction. And knowing that cephalosporin and penicillin um, have a connectedness in terms of the reactions, I, in the back of my mind, I was already kind of anticipating it in a way. Um, but really just noticing as soon as he complained about the throat tightness, like that's always to me a red flag that someone has something more going on um, when their symptoms have changed and he wasn't experiencing that before. So that was the big red flag for me. Alyssa, when you came into the room, um, Alicia had identified that an anaphylactic reaction was ongoing. Did from her report from her tone, did you get a sense of if that was a mild or moderate or severe reaction? Um, from her tone, honest, she was pretty calm and, and really confident in, in what she was assigning to me. I think just by looking at Bruce, I knew it was probably getting, I mean, had we not stopped the, the medication infusion, then it definitely would have got worse. But uh, I think when I walked in, it was it was, you could tell things were under control and she just needed an extra hand. So that's how I felt about it. Yeah, I thought that was really nicely done that through Bruce's body language, we could see that this was a severe situation. Mm -hmm. um, but Alicia's communication made the environment quite moderate and manageable in a good way. Yeah, so and then, so Alicia, you had identified uh, this severe anaphylactic reaction. You had communicated with your team. What would you say, what was the key intervention that turned around this patient's course? Um, I would give credit to two of them. So definitely stopping the IV infusion because we saw how quickly the patient um, situation escalated, even just with the few um, moments of the medication administration. And so stopping the medication definitely um, 
made a huge um, difference in the patient outcome. And then definitely the epinephrine was the priority drug that when I got the orders, I knew, okay, I'm going to give that B first. Um, um, for the epinephrine, you were using a modular skills trainer. How did you find that transition from the virtual to the physical? I know I interrupted you to adjust the camera. Yeah, um, I felt like it was smooth. Um, yeah, I just obviously forgot to adjust the camera so you could actually see the skill. Um, definitely, um, I caught myself at the end. Uh, you know, I did remember to actually tell the patient, okay, you're going to feel a little poke here. Um, obviously, before giving meds, I like to check, um, you know, patient name, date of birth, and make sure that I have the right patient. Um, in this situation, given that it was an emergency, I'm going to give myself a little bit of slack for that. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, normally, um, it would be a, a different situation when you actually have the patient right here. But in terms of actually performing the skill, um, I felt like it was good. I had all my um, supplies here that the school had provided. And so um, it was cool to actually drop the injection. And um, while I wasn't in a panic mode in terms of I didn't actually have a crashing patient in front of me, I was on camera in front of you guys. So I did kind of feel almost like a simulated version of that um, intensity and the anxiety of like drawing up this important med and um, making sure that I did it in a timely manner while also being safe and making sure everything was done. So That's a and I'll open it up, Bruce, Alyssa, anything else you want to add to um, some takeaways from this scenario, things that you can bring forward to the clinical world? I think to add to that as well, um, in the clinical situation, if this was a real scenario and I was a nursing student who started this um, antibiotic administration, the first person I would have called wouldn't have been a colleague. It would have been the primary nurse and my preceptor, um, which I think obviously then my role in this would have been entirely different. I don't think I would have been the one doing all of the assessments. I don't think I would have been the one to call the doctor. So this actually gave me, I think, more opportunities in this specific scenario than I would have had if this happened in the clinical situation because, you know, you're not going to throw all the responsibility on the student when you have a patient that's entering into anaphylactic shock. So I think this actually gave me a unique role um, versus what I maybe could have been provided in a real um, clinical situation. Well, thanks so much all for joining this virtual simulation. I really appreciate your time and your participation in this debriefing. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye. Okay, so we've just seen the uh, scenario and uh, we're hearing commentary from uh, some of the other panelists. Uh, for you, doctor, after reviewing the scenarios, what went well when considering the debriefing? I thought that the debriefer did a great job of setting the safe container. I, um, it was very direct um, and inviting and it really set the stage for a great conversation. I also thought there was good interaction between the participants and the debriefer and that everyone had an opportunity to talk about what went on and um, how they approached each aspect of the situation with this particular patient. Um, I did think that there was a good conversation about feelings and about how the participants were feeling after the scenario ended. And I did think that it was great that there was a conversation about what was the key intervention and the key issue. So that was really obvious for everyone as they left the experience. It was forefront in everyone's mind what had occurred and how it had unfolded. And all of the possibilities had been discussed. 
I think they did very well. It was a great to provide a thorough presentation through the pre-briefing in this telesimulation situation, because in the situations it helps nursing students understand the situation they meet, so how the process goes and the roles. So they could be prepared very well to play their roles and part, and they start to was able to assess whether they met the running outcomes or not. Overall, I think they did a pretty good job. So that was really nice to see. Um, so for example, going back to the standards, uh, it was, it's very important to, to have that orientation and it was great to see a thorough orientation uh, in this, in this uh, telesim because what they were able to do is provide an example of what to expect in the simulation, what everybody's roles were, uh, a little bit of preparation with you know use of video cameras, who's going to be on and off and what that means. And so those are all really important to be able to sort of again lay that foundation for the simulation. And I, once again, I cannot overemphasize you know how preparation how important that is um, to in order to facilitate the simulation and so uh, just talking about facilitation so you can tell that the facilitator wasn't actually in the simulation he was turned off he obviously was in the background um, but so I would gather that for the prompts and the cues that there was obviously some kind of communication between the uh, the facilitator and the, the confederate or the patient because that was sort of the way to embed those prompts and cues in the simulation uh, and you could see those throughout the whole activity which was really really good I think there was also a really good transition at the end of the simulation for, for when you have your active simulation and when it's over and that very you know strong verbal cue of saying, okay, now we're transitioning to the next phase or to the debriefing phase because it's very important for for participants to sort of sort of mentally you know disengage from the active sim and then get ready for the debriefing phase because it does require a different sort of um, reflective brain in that case so it was good to see that sort of transition so like I said overall I think that they they did a pretty good job thanks James and the people who have run the tele sim really have done an incredible job in bringing that to life on, on a virtual or a distance platform because uh, the simulations that we have traditionally used as was the simulation that have been used in that scenario has been designed for face-to-face -face simulation but it does really highlight the value of running a simulation or using the standards of best practice simulation design when thinking about how to shift a scenario that has been designed for face-to-face -face simulation to uh, what they've called a, a telehealth or tele um, simulation uh, approach. And so some of the things that went really well were uh, around the effectiveness of the brief. So the pre-simulation brief was something that was incredibly thorough. Not all of the information, you know, you don't have the background to what was designed in terms of uh, the pre-simulation brief, but it was pretty clear that a lot of thinking and a lot of planning had gone through uh, or had been undertaken in helping not just the participants, but the simulated patient or the actor uh, and everyone thinking about what's going to be required to shift this from a face-to-face -face delivery to a virtual one or an online one. So the scenario really had a very good briefing, not only in terms of the scenario itself, your traditional briefing, but really making sure that people were comfortable and knew what to expect in terms of uh, running the scenario. Now, the other parts I want to comment on around the pre-simulation brief, I guess, but also one of the standards of simulation design is that around the using the various types of fidelity. And this was something that there were some fantastic elements uh, put into the design here. The first was simulating the presence of people in a room. So the rules, one of the first things I noticed was the rules around turning your camera on, turning your camera off to signify whether you're in or out of the, of the, of the space. And that was, that was quite good to see, quite enjoyable to watch. Some other areas of where fidelity was considered in a really meaningful way. So to look at the ways that the situation could be replicated in an authentic way, were thinking were, were the ways that they use the patient monitor, the, the choice of using a simulated patient rather than a mannequin, 
uh, and the view, the cues and the prompts that were built in uh, to that particular use of the simulated patient, uh, the use of the telephone recording that came across, uh, and even just the roles of the uh, facilitator in the role of the doctor uh, were all really nice uh, ways of doing it. But I particularly liked in this scenario the use of the patient monitor. I thought that was really clever. Uh, and as well as the visual cues that you got from a simulated patient and really effective use of simulated patients as well. There was also clear consideration around what artifacts, what elements of practice were really important. So the medications, the syringe, uh, the vials, those sorts of things that were authentic artifacts of practice and what needed to be in that situation uh, for a realistic experience. So they were, they were all quite uh, nice elements to think of fidelity um, in its in all its different all its different components. The other part that I think was done really really well was the um, was just well I think the whole package came together really nicely in providing a nice experience of a rehearsal. And so simulation in itself, there's a you know, number of different definitions of simulation, but one of those is uh, as a rehearsal. And mm -hmm. there is no doubt that the situation that was replicated, even though it was kind of like um, the reading of a play or something in, in it or a movie in its very early stages of rehearsal, where everyone sits in a circle and they read off the script and they're talking through the, um, the, 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 the action or the scene or whatever as, as a rehearsal for a play. I saw this as something very similar, but the, the emotion that was generated was quite real. So if we're watching Alicia uh, during the, uh, as the patient's condition was deteriorating, we started to see that the person was having visual signs of respiratory distress. They were unable to speak in full sentences. Um, the monitor was alarming. Uh, and Alicia's tone of voice uh, elevated her, um, uh, her uh, tone of voice, her volume uh, escalated as well. So she was clearly showing some signs, even in a little way, of, of uh, emotional engagement with the situation, which is always something beautiful uh, to see with, with simulation in one of the, the, the situations or the, in the elements that you want, to, um, uh, you want to reconstruct or to generate. So that was great. Thank you. Um, now, there's always room for continuous improvement though, right? So um, what alterations, what changes could have been made to better align with uh, the standards of best practice uh, in debriefing? Sure. Um, I think there's probably two things that I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of. When the debriefing began, um, it began with a discussion about feelings, and then it went into this uh, kind of the recollection phase, the recalling what happened. But we skipped over the who is this patient piece. And that's easy to do when we do screen-based virtual simulation. We forget that in order for us to embed this experience into our learners' brains around patient care, we have to attach it to the human characteristics of a patient. And how we do that, how we convert the avatar or how we convert the human or how we convert the mannequin into this patient in our brains is really through those human characteristics, their story. And so a good simulation has a good story, but also we point out the story in debriefing. We talk about what we know about the person. And I'm not just talking about the medical diagnosis. I'm talking about the human piece because that's how we remember people. That's how we remember situations that we take into practice later. And stories stick, don't they? They I mean, sure they, do. Yeah, they stick and they allow us to, they allow us to process and, and remember. So they thank you very do. much, doctor. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but thank you very much. Any any final comments on the uh, scenario before we uh, before we close? Uh, the only other thing I would add is that we have to remember that when we recall or we we um, go through what happened, we also have to do that reflection piece. Reflection is really really the key to good debriefing, and so as you're thinking about each 
thing that occurred. You really want the debriefer to probe in. And what were you thinking? And what did that mean? And how did you then come to the next decision so that you, the debriefer, really get inside the head of the learners and really make sure that what you think you saw them do and, and you think made sense actually made sense as they were thinking about it also. It's about intent, right? It's rooting it out is. what their intent is. Sure. It sure. is. And it's about matching knowledge and in knowledge and intent. It's about matching um, decision making and actions and making sure that everything is in alignment. Good critical thinking. Absolutely. In Taylor simulation situation, when we try to align more closely to the standard of best practice outcomes and objectives, I think it is very important to think about how much activities that can be performed directly so which can be assessed or evaluated with SMART SMART criteria to meet the objectives. Even in these situations, nursing students assess the patients only by asking the questions and EKG monitoring. There was a limitation that they couldn't actually see the patient visually. So if possible, in a given teller simulation situation, so we can use standardized patients which can increase the real situation and in which nursing student can assess the patients and visually and more directly. Also, it is very important to establish outcomes that can be assessed through a direct performance. That's all. Thank you very much. Right. Well, like everything we do, you can always improve on things, right? So mm -hmm. that, of course, is, is always the case. Um, so in this kind of experience, realism can be challenging uh, just because of the kind of, it's just because of the kind of environment. So again, with the, with the prompts and the cues, using your, your confederate or your, your patient in this environment, one of the ways to do that is to use them to provide those prompts and cues. So early on when he was discussing his allergy history, uh, he wasn't really short of breath. His SATs were 94. So I probably would have expected something like that more just because you want to give the student not a sense of urgency, but to say, you know, not everything is all okay here. So uh, I don't know what kind of communication was uh, what happened between the two, but it definitely would be helpful to see that because the facilitator really is using that, that person as their proxy uh, or their voice to speak in that simulation. Uh, having said that, they did this really well when the patient went into anaphylaxis, so I would have just liked to see that a little bit more uh, throughout the whole simulation. Now with the simulation itself, we're just seeing one part, just the actual live simulation. So it would have been nice to see what other kinds of materials or preparatory materials were provided to the participants prior to the simulation, because again, that sort of sets the stage for, for the simulation. So these are, they are small, but they do add up and they can affect how the facilitation unfolds, which ultimately can also affect how the debriefing unfolds in that simulation. And just while I was, while we're talking on this topic, one thing that I just sort of wanted to add that I've been noticing in the past little while is we're, we're all seeing this real surge in the virtual simulation use, which is, which is great. Uh, I understand it's out of necessity and a lot of people are jumping into the deep end of this simulation, this virtual simulation world without, necessar without not necessarily having that background in simulation pedagogy. So what I'm seeing and hearing in different kinds of, of areas are that people have the same kinds of, of concerns or same kinds of struggles that we had maybe five or seven years ago with in-person simulation. And we're now just seeing that coming out in the virtual simulation. We're trying new things, seeing how this works, seeing how this doesn't work. So we are a little bit uh, behind in terms of the pedagogy of virtual simulation compared to where we are with in-person simulation. Having said that, I think that we will catch up really quickly just because we do have some background and great groundwork uh, in our understanding of the pedagogy of teaching with simulation. And I think we're starting to see, like we're doing here, applying these concepts 
in a slightly different kind of simulation experience. So like I said, I think we'll catch up really quickly, but we are a little bit behind. So just, you know, be kind with yourself, know that you're just learning, and uh, but just always go back to the basics and apply them to your new environment, and you'll find that you'll be a lot more comfortable doing uh, something more like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some, one of the, the big things that was a standout for me was really the purpose of the, the simulation scenario itself. And I don't mean that in a way of, of what was the point of it, because clearly understanding anaphylaxis or providing students with a situation of a, or an experience of a deteriorating patient is clearly there is a purpose to that. But for this particular scenario, particularly if we apply the, the uh, an actual standard of best practice for simulation design to thinking about uh, running scenarios via virtually that, or via a virtual platform or by a distance platform where we would otherwise do it face to face is why is this situation important and why are we running this particular scenario for this cohort of students and the actual standards of best practice for simulation design focus very clearly on that and in the first criteria uh, for that standard is to un is to run a needs assessment so it might be implied it, it, or it might be um, conducted but we just didn't see it because that, what we weren't privy to that uh, design element or that time from what we saw in the scenario. But I'm thinking that uh, the comment I've made really does then stem to the next uh, criteria for the Inaxal Standards of Best Practice simulation design and that's around the reason for constructing measurable objectives. So whilst the uh, scenario was run and there was a good clear briefing, pre-simulation brief and the scenario ran well and there was a nice debrief at the end. Um, the scenario itself, the students were never really provided with an understanding as to why this particular scenario is important to them. Why is it important to nursing practice? Uh, and there, were, there was an absence of uh, learning outcomes or learning objectives stated either in the pre-simulation brief and also at the end in the debrief to provide a context for that learning. And so there was undoubtedly learning had occurred. We, we heard the conversation in the debrief, but how it actually related to this particular scenario and why that was important for these students um, yeah, wasn't clear. And that was probably the biggest uh, element, I think, that, that uh, could be an area for improvement. The other part that would be really, really important, and again, it might be something that we just didn't see in that particular scenario, because it's more to do with the facilitators and the designers of the simulation or the people who run the simulation. And that comes around uh, to um, pilot testing, and it all comes down to, also comes to evaluation. So pilot testing in, in this scenario or in this situation would be incredibly important to see how well it's gonna work uh, and what might work and what might not work. Now, my hunch is that they did. Um, do some pilot testing because there's no way my, my gut feeling is that there's no way that you'd run that scenario for the first time and get a successful outcome like I did. Yep. The other part, there were, there were just too many moving parts. But one of the things that would be incredibly important for this is to um, make sure that there is a, uh, an opportunity to evaluate. So from a student perspective, from the or a learner perspective and from a facilitator perspective and indeed from possibly a simulated patient perspective as well, because if we are shifting simulation that have otherwise been run face to face, if we are running, if we have a culture of face to face simulation and all of a sudden we're, we're swapping that or we're moving to a on more of an online or a distance delivery, we want to understand what it is that we're doing and how effectively are we doing it and what are the um, pros and what are the cons so we do get a better understanding of uh, what it is that we're doing. Andrew, I think you're muted. And I am, I was muted. So let's try that over again. That's, that's what happens when we do this live. So uh, greetings everyone from New York. Uh, I'm Andrew Kristovic, the Senior Content Marketing Manager. And uh, before I introduce our guests, I'm just gonna go through some, uh, some housekeeping rules. I was telling you, telling everyone it's a beautiful day here in New York. 
Um, a little overcast, uh, but great colors on the trees and it's uh, making everybody start to think of Thanksgiving here, I think. Um, so all attendees will be muted uh, during this Q&A session just to eliminate background noise. Please use the Zoom Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to send us your questions. We already have some questions queued up. Yes, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone. Um, so that'll eliminate uh, one of the questions, uh, one of the big questions right off the bat. And uh, please, uh, please continue to follow our Sun Sessions. We have one more uh, at the end of uh, the year, and we'll tell you about that at the end of the Q&A session. So uh, I'm uh, privileged and uh, humbled to be introducing Dr. Christina thomas Dryfurst, Director uh, of the PhD Program and Associate Pref Professor at Marquette University College of Nursing. Great to have you on board, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be with you and, and with all of our attendees today. And, and I think um, you may be working on some overtime because you introduced, <laughs> you introduced this very same session in uh, the Pacific Rim last night uh, for our Asia Pacific market. So um, yes. you're probably, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there's some caffeine uh, <laughs> on, on your desk right now. It wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> so um, as the questions come in, um, just one question to, to begin with. And, and for the benefit of our audience, we're going to focus primarily on the Anaxal standards of best practice here. There have been some questions coming in about how to create a scenario like the one people have seen. We encourage people to join the Sun Facebook community and uh, we'll be able to field those questions there. So uh, we're going to focus on the Anaxal standards of best practice. Why is it so important to ask people how they feel? That's the first question out of the starting gate. And kind of curious, why is that so important? And where, where did it ultimately, if you know, where, where did it originate from? Sure. Um, well, we know that emotions and um, reactions and responses uh, play into learning and the ability to learn. And we know that there's actually a couple different things at play. We, we know from, um, from both our behavioral scientists and our cognitive scientists that sometimes emotion um, highlights or augments the experience and so you remember it more acutely. And sometimes emotion deters from learning. The emotion takes over and, and you're so focused on the emotion you can't get to the learning. So there's kind of a sweet spot. So one of the things you want to do is you want to acknowledge the emotion, you want to uh, bring it forward, but you don't want to get stuck down that rabbit hole. Because if you spend all of your debriefing time dealing with the emotion, then you don't get to the other pieces like uh, recollection and reflection and sense making that are also important pieces. So, um, so there is a, um, a target and you want to make sure that you that you work to hit it does it give you as the person doing the debriefing um sort of sort of a better knowledge of your audience in other words okay now i know now i know what i'm playing with now i now i know um where i have to zero in where i might be encountering some some uh, obstacles with some people who potentially um, have their ego in the way mm -hmm. um, and 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 maybe they need some coaching or some help to get it out of the way would, would Definitely. you agree with that I, absolutely I, I would and um, and it also helps you to um, really understand where you might want to things you might want to highlight and things you might want to avoid uh, for the comfort level of everyone who's participating. Very good, thank you. Uh, now, this uh, a question. A question has come in from Donna, and um, I may have to try to to filter this question just a little bit. But um, if I understand Donna correctly, what she's asking is, or what she's stating is, that it's really hard when you have multiple people on a screen, like we did here. Um, 
it's hard to manage energy gaps. So in other words, you may have one person dominating the conversation, the other people are, are, sort of are in queue, they're in a holding pattern. How do you, how do you manage those um, potential energy gaps? And do you advocate having everybody on camera at the same time so that, um, so that you are keeping people engaged? Sure. Um, for the debriefing piece, I think it's essential that everyone's on camera at the same time. Uh, this is a discussion. It's a group discussion. And by engaging everyone, not just uh, the participants, or some people call them the players, but also including the observers, you know, we're, we are in the process of generating a lot of science, recent papers, recent uh, studies that are showing um, how much the observers learn when they actively participate in the debriefing discussion concurrently with the players or participants. So it's really important. Um, the other thing is your job as a debriefer is to facilitate the discussion. That's, that's your job. And so you have to be comfortable calling on people, calling out people, um, bringing voices forward, moving voices backward, or, or forefront and, and background is are better. You have to be comfortable with silence, even in a virtual environment, and letting your, uh, your participants struggle a little bit with the debriefing questions you're asking, and then prompting them and helping them if, if they don't know the answers, and then really being comfortable with well, if we don't know, then if this was practice, where would we go to find the answers? So I, I, I think you need to think about the screen conversation the same way you think about a face-to-face -face conversation. Your job is to facilitate. No, I'm going to, uh, Ab, uh, Abby has asked a question, um, and I'm going to add to it. Uh, Abby, I hope you don't mind. Uh, so we watched a scenario, we've got two students, what about a larger group with eight or 15 students? And so what I'd like to add to that is, if you are managing a large group, do you tend to call on people? And is there, um, do you tend to call on people in terms of their linear uh, involvement in the scenario. So if one person is encountering the patient for the first time and then other people are coming in, let's say it's a code, and we've gone from somebody identifying that the patient's in cardiac arrest to now we've, we've got uh, an intubation occurring, we've got IVs being established and so forth. How do you manage that? Or do you tend to focus on, I, I, I recall you're saying you like to f zero in on something very specific that occurred or maybe didn't occur during a scenario. Bottom line is big groups. How do you like to manage big groups? Right. Um, I think my, my key in a big group is to make sure that as many people are engaged in the conversation as possible. So I, I will call on people and say, well, do you agree? Do you ha or I might by name, you know, I might say, Joe, we haven't heard from you yet. What would you be thinking about doing in this situation? Or is there an alternative here that you might have considered or whatever prompt that you want to use? But I do call on people to get people into the conversation. Um, and, and you can successfully debrief large groups as long as you remember that group dynamic. You remember that you need to keep everybody involved, look for the eye contact, um, look for who is you know, nodding their head or that they're participating and then get them speaking as much as you can. Sure. Do you advocate that um, educators provide their learners with any training as to how to, to behave or perform during a debrief so that they go in with a certain expectation? It's a lot for uh, an educator to, to establish the right environment, this environment of trust and environment of safety. Uh, do you, I'm sure you must do some pre-briefs, but is there more to it than that? Mm -hmm. I think um, we, we know now, and there's growing literature that talks about the importance of orienting um, your learners to the entire experience. 
So what's expected even in preparatory work? What's expected in pre-brief? What's expected during the scenario? And then what's expected in the debrief? And then any, any post activities that, that might be attached to this experience. Um, we know that when we set the expectation, everybody's more comfortable and um, the learning is enhanced. Very good, thank you. Um, so I'm monitoring other questions that are coming in. Again, we're gonna to try to focus on those questions that are, are in Axel standards of best practice uh, questions. So while we're waiting for a few others, you and I had talked about uh, the difference between military debriefing and <laughs> uh, debriefing in healthcare. And uh, you said something very interesting, and I, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your experience with um, the military and why healthcare debriefing is, is a bit different from what you used uh, during training uh, with, your, uh, with your military personnel. Sure. So it, it all comes down to what is what is the event or what is the situation, the scenario that's occurring and whether or not um, it is more procedural or more task training based or more of an encounter based simulation. And, you know, oftentimes what we what we know from um, how our our colleagues in the military work is many things have a procedure. And so they have a list, a checklist. They have, it, things are, are laid out in a standard operating procedure and you do this and then 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 you do this. And so debriefing focuses then more on feedback because feedback is really the model that you use when you are um, talking about whether something was done right or whether it was done wrong and then what would you do differently? So as you're going down the list, you did this right, you did this right, you did this right. Step number four, you did that wrong. And so then everything after that was affected because step four was incorrect. And so you focus on how to then correct step four. And it's truly, truly a feedback model. Now, when you think about more of an encounter model or a patient care, a healthcare model, we're dealing with human beings and we're dealing with simulations that simulate human experiences. And so many times you come in and the, there isn't just one right. There, there are many approaches that you can take. And so what you wanna understand is what was the thinking behind the action and did that make sense based on the cues? And then you did the action and then there was the response by the patient and that response could be um, physical, it could be physiological, it could be verbal or nonverbal. And based on that response, then what was the next thing you did? And how did you make sense of it? And then so that narration in debriefing, that understanding the thinking that's behind the actions, that's a very different model than a feedback model. It's more of a reflection model and it's a more understanding the sense making that went in because truly, there are many approaches that we take with humans. And it's not that one is necessarily right or wrong. There might be a better choice. Things might be better, but it's not the hard and fast, because you did this, everything else was wrong. Would you, would you thank you for that? Because I, I think it's, um, I, it leads to the next, next question, which is, um, do you think you, you develop better critical thinking in someone with debriefing? And what have you seen when you, when you see a lack of debriefing? Do you see that correlation with a, a lack of critical thinking? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think absolutely. I think the things that we're trying to develop in our um, healthcare professionals are, is this trifecta of critical thinking and clinical judgment and clinical reasoning, these higher order thinking um, aspects. And those are things that are not well developed with just feedback um, or just memorizing it, just do it this way, doesn't really augment that higher order thinking. You really have to think through 
Why are we doing it this way? What is going on? What are the cues? What do you need to think about next time when you apply this to another situation that might be close, but it's not going to be exact to the one you just did? And so for the audience, we didn't choreograph this. I, I just, I, I just, just please understand that. But that leads to what you just said now leads to a quote I wanted to present you with um, just to see how you'd react to it, which is um, routine is a pathway to risk. The idea being that if you be, something becomes so um, repetitive, that you know what to expect, that's where risk lies. And I, I, that's where risk lies. And I'm wondering if you've ever seen that in debriefing where everything becomes so um, perfunctory, as it were, that it, it becomes a check the box exercise. And how would you overcome that? Um, right. I think you're exactly correct. And people ask all the time, why do we use this deep Socratic method in debriefing? Why is questioning so important? Why is it the debriefer's role to keep asking questions? And honestly, it's so that you don't end up in that routine. It's so that when that nurse or healthcare provider is in practice down the line, somewhere in the back of their head, probably not explicit but implicit in their subconscious they are asking themselves those very questions does this make sense how does this make sense is there anything else i should be considering all of the questions you ask them become the questions that they learn to ask themselves again they don't hear themselves doing it but it's part of how they are approaching patient care as, ch as situations change excellent Thank you. I'm going to now go to a question that um, uh, Dorla has, has asked. The best practices identified from the literature review included professional integrity of the facilitator. Could you briefly discuss the topic of integrity of the facilitator? Um, so, um, yes. Uh, what we're talking about is that this is a, a respectful learning environment. So when you set the safe container for debriefing, you're setting the safe container that it's safe for your learners to share with you and for you to share with them, but it's also a respectful place. So this isn't a place where we berate wrong answers. This isn't a place where we uh, make people feel badly or we uh, shame them or we do any of the um, of the disrespectful or um, um, behaviors that would that would somehow um, make the relationship between the facilitator the debriefer and the participant strained this is professional work and we treat each other like professionals are there uh, rules or do you establish guidelines as a, as a um, educator on what happens with the videotapes and so forth? I mean, people are being videotaped and they're naturally going to be, they're going to make mistakes. Is there any assurance for learners that those tapes will be safeguarded and, and, and should there be? Is there some, some standard that is being used? There isn't a standard of best practice per se, as in the st in Excel standards. However, um, yes, there should be rules. There should be a contract. There should be informed information and informed consent when those videotapes are going to be used and how they're going to be used. Everybody should go in understanding what those what what the purpose is and where they're going to be kept and when they're going to be destroyed. Fair enough. Very good. We have a question here that is, um, it's very specific. So this one comes in from Catherine. How would you recommend addressing failure to rescue in a, during a debriefing? So I'd want to understand what happened. I'd really want to go back to 
at the point that things were going well and then they began to not go well, what happened? What, what did the learner interpret in terms of the data that was coming in, in terms of the assessment data, in terms of any other patient data, patient information cues, what, how did they put that together? And then where were they going with what they did? Because you see, learners and, and even clinicians who are in simulations where there's, a, where there's a rescue needed, who fail to rescue, typically don't do that intentionally. Sure, sure. You know, the intention is that they're doing the very best that they know or that they can. And so we need to understand what happened and then work through correcting the misunderstanding, the misinformation, the misinterpretation. Because what happens in a, in a failure to rescue, you either have wrong thinking, wrong action, or you have right thinking, wrong action. Something didn't happen correctly. And you need to go and correct that so that the next time you get the right um, outcome. I, I like your emphasis on, um, it's essentially, what were you thinking? But it's not. But you don't quite say it that way. But it's not posed in a sarcastic way, right? It's not posed posed in a judgmental way. It's more, um, if I can use terms from from my own experience. What was your status on your situational awareness? Um, were you inside the decision loop, or were you so far out that you you really? Um, couldn't make a good decision. Um, did you get um, what in aviation or, or the military is, is target fixation? And we've seen that, I've seen examples of that in healthcare too. Someone gets uh, myopia on, on, on a particular task that they're performing. So uh, I really like your emphasis on, on taking apart what was someone's thought process that guided them to where they are so they can be aware of it. Right. I, I think or that's brilliant. I mean, you could ask, what did it mean to you when this lab came or when this, when the monitor did this or the patient said this, or you heard this and, and start there and then, and then walk through, you know, is it a, is it a knowledge issue? Is it an interpretation issue? Did they miss the cue? I mean, something happened and you need to find out what it was to correct. Very good. So we're coming up. Um, Close to the uh, close to the half hour, and before we close, um, I'd like to ask you, what's your favorite? Um, looking back at your career, what's your what's your favorite debriefing um, success story, or what comes to mind as as a as a debrief that just was transformational? I uh, so I debrief a lot uh, with a lot of different groups. Um, but, and, and I have a handful of favorites, but one of them- And you can talk about more than one, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one of them was with, um, with some uh, practicing colleagues, uh, clinician colleagues, that was a group um, that was primarily um, very seasoned physicians and nurses. And they were in a sim and they didn't really wanna be in the sim. We can start there. And they didn't really think they needed to be in the sim. They felt like they were a team, they worked well together. They didn't see the need for this, but they were doing it because they were told they had to. And we got into the debriefing and we really got into the, the, the questioning and we got into this situation where they made some really interesting choices in the patient care and I really wanted to understand it. And so I was queuing and prompting this discussion and. And it became clear to them that they did not, and to me, that they did not have a shared mental model. That they, while they thought they all were thinking the same thing, they really weren't. And to watch this amazement sort of unpeel and, and the discussion continue and get, get more and more animated as they were like realizing that they weren't all on the same page and that this was important and that they had to get through this. I, I just, I thought this is the pinnacle because it's not just about students 
It's about all of us and how we continue to develop our practice um, because patient care is very complex and always changing. Thank you, doctor. Um, before we go, I'd like to just m mention a few words uh, before I thank you for attending. I'm hoping everybody can just uh, stay on board for uh, just a moment. Um, first of all, I want to thank our audience for attending. Um, it's been great to see people posting where they're from. We've had people from all over the United States. We've had folks from Canada and uh, we've ha had folks from uh, as far away as Israel. We're at eight o'clock right now. Um, so thank you all for attending. I'd like to remind everybody that um, as we still uh, cope with um, the ups and downs of COVID, please look at, uh, uh, check out Lairdall's COVID-19 Resource Center on our page. Um, please join the Sun Facebook community. That's a group exclusively for uh, those of you who have attended a virtual sun. And please watch for our next, next session, which is on December 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's a special webinar that we'll be uh, presenting in conjunction with Modern Healthcare Magazine. The uh, topic is Expose, Explore, and Promote Equitable Care through patient simulation, a hot topic, and it's gonna be a great topic to finish the year with. So thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, Dr. Christina thomas Dreifers. thank you so much. I know you'd like me to call you Chris, but, uh, <laughs> and, and I will in the future, but, um, but thank you very much for joining us and thank you for sharing your expertise. It's been wonderful. And uh, I'm sure at this point you'd like to get some sleep and, uh, and step away from a monitor for a while. But again, thank you for being with us. It's been a real pleasure. and. Uh, we're uh, privileged to have you on board. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.